And I think even Charles Darwin kind of could not explain that uh, himself when it comes to social insect because either B or N does not fit into the individual selection model. So later people coming out, come out with, uh, you know, inclusive fitness, they say, oh, it's a kin selection, not just you individual, but the entire kin, but really does not really fly very well. So I thought initially, I said, okay, this is my insect. This is the question I'm going to answer. But I really didn't go that way, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back today. We're going to have somebody I'm really excited to talk to because this is one of the top entomologists I've been looking forward to. We've got Dr. Nan Yao Su uh, from the University of Florida. He is a PhD in entomology. How are you doing today? Good, good, doing great. Uh, good to have you. Uh, we were talking beforehand about your specialty, which is termites. Um, so let's just start off. How did you get started? with termites what what interested you in these little guys okay so this before termite um let's go all the way back to i'm actually interested in a living thing organism uh that's sort of like my childhood question since i was little and say what's the what's the thing that's a living and what is not living and that's kind of my question i would ask myself when i was little right but so i'm always interested interesting to try to study some biology but plant is kind of does not move so much. So it's kind of uh, not very interesting. Okay. Animal, it's really, I'm very curious to, 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 to examine, to, to observe animal. But to study animal, I'm squamish with blood. The red blood really scare me. So that's kind of limit my scope to, you know, insect because insect does not have a red blood. They have blood, but not red blood. Okay, so so that ended up being insect. So I did study insect when I was in you know, undergraduate to master degree, and when I was in Japan, I started the silkworm. And then uh, when I switched to Hawaii, when I went to Hawaii to my PhD, I learned my lesson from my study in with silkworm back in Japan that if you want to <clears throat> study insect, uh, whatever you do, you need a lot of them. You need a lot of repetition. So I was looking, I was looking for some insect that can easily catch the large number. Well, guess what? University of Hawaii campus is heavily infested by termite. You put a wooden stake in soil, wait for a week or so. You go there, there, pull one wooden stake out from the ground, you have a 3,000 termite. So, so that's kind of thing. This is my, it's my insect I would like to start with, you know. So, but that, that kind of, direct, you know, easy question, but interesting thing, I, I was also interested in, in termite in terms of there being a social insect. And the social insect is very interesting because it really does not fit the uh, individual fitness model or the Darwin is proposed. Darwin evolution is based on individual fitness, individual selection, meaning that uh, each individual, if you're more fit, then you can reproduce, produce more offspring, and therefore all the offspring eventually will carry a trait and keep going like that. Well, termite really does not fit the model because within a colony of termite, you may have about one million termites. The only one that reproduces is a king and queen. The rest of them do not reproduce at all. So why a, a soldier or worker of termite will sacrifice themselves to help the mother reproduce their sibling instead of going out there try to reproduce themselves. Why majority of them I don't do that? That's kind of puzzled me. It puzzled a lot of people too. And I think even Charles Darwin kind of could not explain that uh, himself when it comes to social insect because either B or N does not fit into individual selection model. So later people coming out, come out with, uh, you know, inclusive fitness. They say, oh, it's a kin selection, not just you individual, but the entire kin, but really does not really fly very well. So I thought initially, I said, okay, this is my insect. This is the question I'm going to answer. 
But I really didn't go that way, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, are there other insects you you mentioned ants and bees? Are uh, which one is most similar to the termite? Well, in terms of sociality wise, uh, termites have evolved. Termites much older insect in, in evolution wise. Uh, it's much more primitive insect, and they become social, and uh, later. Uh, Wasp and bee, and also the well, bee and ant become social too, but they come from a totally different group. But in terms of phylogeny anyways, you know, termites actually evolve from cockroach. They are actually social cockroach. Wow. So, yeah. so they are very similar to cockroach. In fact, just recently, after the DNA uh, data come out, they dump. Uh, Thermite and cockroach in the same group. Now we belong to the same order, Brattoidea. Instead of we should use to call isophila separate, but we are dumped together. Wow. Mm. That's so interesting. And so, but they differ very much so in the in the food that they eat, right? Cockroaches versus termites. Yeah. Uh, except the there are many cockroaches too. And there is a cockroach called wood roach that only live in the wood. <clears throat> And these cockroaches have a very similarity with the primitive termite in terms of their gut have a protozoan and there's a microorganism that help them to digest wood. So the wood roach also eat wood and the way they can eat wood, digest wood because they have this protozoan inside their gut and same thing with termite. So with everything we know in the DNA similarity, we now know that Cockroach that the termite probably evolved from something that looks like wood roach, cockroach. Wow. Interesting. And, and as far as the digestion difference between something like a termite and an ant, what's the difference in their digestion? Well, termite is only one of the few organisms that can break down wood, cellulose. Okay, cellulose is a very abundant, probably the most abundant polymer on Earth. And uh Bee, for example, eat nectar. They don't eat wood. Ant does not eat wood. Even carpenter wood that dig the hole inside the wood do not digest wood. They just borrow the hole inside there to live there. Oh. Uh, so very few animals eat wood except termite. Termite only one can break down cellulose, which is a very important significance to it because think about it, right? So. We say the living organism here, all the animal here, why, how we get our energy. We either eat plant, or we eat animal that eat plant. So everything can go back to plant. The, where the plant get the energy from, right? Well, photosynthesis. You know, plant, we absorb the sunlight and then using chlorophyll in their body to break, to synthesize the, uh, use the sunlight, uh, sunlight as energy to synthesize carbon uh, carbon dioxide and water into carbohydrate and they put the carbohydrate inside the body and the, 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 the high carbohydrate could be in different form right so you and i eating are actually a very small part of the photosynthesis product because 95 percent of the photosynthesis product are stored in the form of wood fiber cellulose which you and i cannot digest most animals cannot digest and so when we say we are eating energy coming from plant, we are only eating about 5 to 10% of it. Wow. And not even that. The, re the rest of the 90, 95% are sitting there and they break down by either fungi or termite is one of the few animals actually break it down. Right, right. And the fungi, that's not to be forgotten as far as things that eat wood and do a great job of, of, of kind of... Oh. Is, is fun, fungus is pretty cool, too. Did you ever have the feeling like you wanted to study fungus? I love to study fungus <laughs> because I love to eat mushroom. Oh, uh, me I too. Like to be, I'd like to be able to find out which one is edible, which one is not. <laughs> that's the only reason, actually. Yeah. Well, but, but, you, you come from that side of the pond where in Asia, the, the, amount, the kind of mushrooms, edible mushrooms, are just amazing. Um, uh, oyster mushrooms. So what are some of your favorite? We're going to completely off topic, but what's some of your favorite kind of edible mushrooms? Oh, you know what? I just found a, oh my God. I don't know the scientific name for that. I have a house in North Carolina in Asheville, and I go there for the summertime. And North Carolina is... It's a mushroom, 
people love mushroom. You go to the mountain, there's a tons of wild mushroom hanging around there, right? I saw the other day, or well, last year, we saw the uh, uh, the uh, uh, a mushroom called lion's head. And it looks like a gigantic tofu, like a brain type of structure. And it's just a very interesting texture to it. it you want to eat it, the farm enough to think like it's a meat, but it is not. You know, but I, that's the thing about fungi is that it's more texture food than the flavor food. You know, yeah. texture is very important to me. You yeah. know, when it comes to food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I grow my own edible mushrooms. We get these kits in the mail, and we try different kinds of stuff. But that's an amazing offshoot of uh, nature right there. I just love yeah. so much. Well, fungi is interesting. It has its own kingdom. You have a plant, right? You have an animal, right? We all think this is kingdom, right? Well, fungi have its own kingdom. It's totally different classification. Yeah. Doesn't need um, direct sunlight or photosynthesis, anything specifically like that. It just kind of has its own. And it breaks down a lot. Like it has a symbiotic relationship with some of the decay and stuff. Yes. So, yeah. Do, do termites have a beneficial symbiotic relationship to some parts of the environment? Uh, they do uh, in terms of being able to... Uh, you know, uh, uh, they also, some termite actually, uh, cannot digest wood. Insect, instead, they will bring the, uh, deep litter inside the nest and they place a plant, a little fungal spore on top of it. Then the fungi break down the fiber and then they eat fungi. Cool. Yeah. And the other thing of a symbiotic relationship with termite is a group of uh, beetles called the termitophile. And I can say file meaning the friend of termite. And okay. this group of beetles actually living inside termite colony, inside a nest. And termite are blind, they can't see anything. But these beetles will re try to make it the body shape looks like termite. <laughs> And uh, so when the termite touch them, they don't know it's actually the beetles. So these beetles actually have a more like a parasitic relationship. Sometimes they go wander into termite nest and eat their egg, uh -huh. but termite does not know this is the, and they're eating the egg. They just think this is another termite. Wow. So that type of the, the large group of uh, termitophile exists all over in different world, uh, world in different species of termite. Wow. That's crazy. Oh, those the parasitic style things in nature kind of I always go, Ugh, that's that's yeah. sort of dishonest, isn't it? Yeah, but you know, just think of if you're your family, right? And some guest inside your house, you don't even know it's a guest. You think it's a part of family member. At the midnight, he come out and eat your baby. You know, that's <laughs> kind of thing. That, that, that's kind of thing. Like, it's kind of <laughs> creepy to me. Yeah. Uh, there's this uh, one of the uh, birds where they, they push some of the eggs out of the nest and then yeah, they... Yeah, cuckoo. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. fool the bird into raising their young form. Yeah, um, yeah. Interesting, little upsetting at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Biology is fascinating. Yeah, I love it. That's why I started this, so I could talk to people like you, know their stuff, and tell me amazing things. Um, so with your time in, uh, you started in Taiwan, you moved to mm -hmm. Japan, and then you kind of made your way to Hawaii, slow, slowly mm -hmm. working your way towards the United States. Uh, did you find there to be a big difference in the science and the way science is done in these places? Uh, in terms of how the science is done, I don't see much differences because in scientific field, we are open and we have a very same goal, looking for truth, make observations, and try to explain what's going on there. Uh, you know, that's kind of all universal uh, procedure. But in terms of institution-wise, how people conduct science at the different university, yeah, there's a major difference between Japan and, and the United States. Is there, uh, w uh, as far as prioritizing funding and stuff, do, do who does the best job at um, prioritizing the right kind of projects i think america is really? america t tend to be uh uh you know we have a very solid system i'm not sure i'm not saying it's perfect but we have a very solid system to provide funding for almost anybody who want to you know do the research uh and if, if the funding agency think it's uh it's worthy 
uh, for you to do that. And that is kind of if, right? The who is making the judgment, right? And anyway, that's so, uh, you know, you most of people get funding enough to do it. That's the reason why uh, most talented scientists all over the world want to come to this country because the opportunity is open, wide open. Yeah, yeah. Good. You're in Germany. We just hired two, two German guys to join our faculty. <laughs> where and where, how did have they started working yet? Oh yeah. Uh, what do they? Th what? How how are they doing? Do they have a little culture shock? Or are they doing okay? No, no, no. They're doing great. Uh, the typical German way is you know very uh, precise, very <laughs> tedious, very detail oriented. You know. <laughs> yeah, I know it so well now. I married a German and and. Oh my god. <laughs> they, they come on time. That's right. Yes. Uh, don't argue with them, okay? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. No, but uh, the science here is also pretty good as far as funding and employment and 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 prioritization. They do pretty good here, I would say. But again, yeah. then again, I'm not a scientist. I'm just a musician. <laughs> so okay. Um, so what you know, you develop some technology that's been really groundbreaking and can, trying to control these. Um, uh, these termites in a different way. Why was it necessary for you to come up with this technology? Is is the way that we were doing before not sustainable? Or well, when I first look at the joint the uh, uh, you know department when I was enrolled in as a graduate student back in Hawaii, I, I did not know anything about termite. You know, I never even seen termite before, <laughs> except when I was a little, they're flying around in Taiwan. Uh, but I didn't even know at the time that was a termite. Anyway. So, uh, so I, as I learn more, I realize that the typical way of people treating termite is to uh, drill a hole through your concrete foundation on your house and inject pesticide underneath there. And, uh, and this large quantity of pesticide in, they inject underneath there. Uh, so, and the idea here is to create a chemical barrier underneath your house so termite don't come in. And because termite, especially for most of the termite in Hawaii, is that they form a real large colony. And if you have a house that is infested by uh, for most of the termites, try to draw a circle of 100 meters around your house. The nesting structure is somewhere within the soil of that circle, 100 meters. Okay. And uh, you may have several million termites living underneath there. And so when you inject, drill, inject, Pesticide underneath there, you probably kill ten to thousand, maybe hundred thousand, but the majority of the termite is within that one hundred meter circle still survive, mm. and nobody really addressed that question: What happened to this termite? Where did they go? Well, where did they go? Number one, they may go to the next door neighbor. <laughs> number two, <laughs> <laughs> number two. I don't care how much you, you drill, inject, uh, you're not going to have a chemical barrier that is complete. In other words, unless you leave your house off the soil, spray and put it back. The chemical barrier put there is not at the best incomplete. So what's going to happen? The termite is still there, right? They go back to your house. But that is a technique uh, being developed in 1940, 1930, 1940. Okay. And then uh, people kind of convinced that's the only way to do it. And being a rebel like me, I say, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so instead of trying to create a barrier, to me, creating a barrier is like build a fortress, right? Just to think about how useful the fortress we have today. Uh, Chinese people build a great wall to prevent the nomadic people, Mongolian, from coming in. Did, were they successful? No. <laughs> 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 they built a gigantic wall. Yeah. If the Mongolian want to come in, they keep coming in anyway. Yeah, you know? yeah. If you have a barrier, they'll be breached. Yeah, yeah. That's, my, that, that's sort of like, a, you, know, you know, the conclusion is that barrier never work. Yeah. And I kind of, you know, I, I'm, I'm a history buff. I, I love to read history book. And I know the, if create the barrier, the most likely, if you do a DNA system hanging around there, they're going to find a way in. Right, <laughs> you know? right, right, right. So, you know, anyway, if you, if you learn anything from Jurassic Park, that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so, anyway, so I thought instead of 
create the barrier, can I address the population underneath there? That's a medium of termite in a huge area. Can I do something to kill them? That is kind of premise I went after. Mm. And so, yeah. and so, essentially, it, you'd go more of a kind of a Trojan horse kind of. Now, I don't know what it is, and I don't know if it's proprietary information, but it seems like that's what you would do, right? So send some yeah. kind of something to the to the queen or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is that you know when you have a the underground nesting system that spreads so far away, hundred meter, and very complicated, you have a very intricate network of tunnel underneath in the soil there. There's no way you can force your pesticide inside there. Yeah. And pesticide is not going to get in if you inject it in. It's going to go about this far. That's about it, right? So the way I look at it is that how about the term I carry those poison back to the colony and uh, give to each other. And then eventually, you know, entire colony have enough dose of it will collapse. And that's kind of the model I was thinking. So it, you you saw that the pesticide method was inefficient in this way. Did you also have the idea that there was some knock-on effects for human beings for the, the exposure of these pesticides? Yeah, you know, the amount of pesticide you use uh, in the uh, to treat the house is about a few a couple kilograms. That's pure pesticide. Which, if you compare that one to even agriculture use of pesticide, that is like about 40, 50 times higher dose. And you spread that kind of dose around people's house, right? So in old days, for example, we used to use a, this very persistent chemical called chlorodin. That is a, a chlorodin hydrocarbon. It's, it's beyond the same group like a DDT, by the way. And those chemicals are very persistent. It doesn't break down. If you put in the soil, in the environment, it stay. It stay for years, 10, 20, 30 years, right? So because it's so persistent, people use them a lot. In the old days, they think the more persistent, it's better. So if the barrier fails, they come back, keep injecting the same thing, same thing again. <laughs> By 1980s, people start to kind of worry about it. And there are a couple studies being done in Japan, in Australia, that if you have a pregnant woman in the house and then you uh, happen to have a termite treated for this chemical, they can test this chemical from mother's milk. <laughs> you know, this such a this small dose, so they don't say what's going to happen to part of the baby. They just say, yeah, it found in this milk. That's how persistent it is because that's, that's the problem with the persistent chemical is that, yeah, from termite control point of view, it's good because the barrier is always going to be there. But from environmental point of view, it's a disaster. Right. Because it doesn't break down, it goes everywhere. There is that, there's always the concern if, if it's an insecticide, pesticide, something that's supposed to kill one living being, don't forget you're a living being too, and so is your dog and everything else. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so my, my idea at the time is that, you know, if I can use termite to deliver the, the toxin into the other individual, I probably do not need a lot of pesticide because it's very precise, targeted approach. Yeah. And, uh, and I also are looking for something more slow acting, non repairing type of chemicals that is have a very limited effect for non target insect or non target organism. So that's kind of thing that, that, that I can went after. Has anybody ever asked you to think about solving some other pest problems from other insects that may be, or are you just the termite guy? I'm, I don't think they ever ask. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and, and, and one thing is, of course, the, uh, you know, this, just like everything else, it's very territorial. I mean, if somebody study fire ant or study a mosquito, I mean, they're the expert in the mosquito. They don't want the people like a termite guy to come in to solve right, the problem. Right, right. <laughs> and, and <laughs> insult to them. <laughs> but unless the 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 the, uh, the creatures were very similar in some way, where that you're, you know. But other than that, you're just a man in the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, and I think that being an expert in something's obviously got massive amount of benefits when you spend your life's work. Uh, uh, and you are. You became highly recommended as the termite guy. <laughs> yeah. So, other than that, um, you 
used to play music. You you love dogs. So you, I asked you this before. Uh, you as an animal lover, loving biology and stuff. Did you ever feel bad for what you had to do to these poor little guys? Do you ever kind of anthropomorphize and kind of have an attachment to them? I have to confess, I do. <laughs> 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 I really do, especially in recent years. I start started getting older. I probably de de develop more empathy to you know the other animals, and I have uh, two dogs, and and uh, you know uh, I love to watch uh, uh, you know net uh, uh, animal show. I mean you know something like that. Yeah, you know termites. It's actually. If you look at the mosquito, I don't think I, I feel so bad to them. I can just smash them when they try to suck my blood. <laughs> or if the if the uh, wasp try to chase me, try to sting me, I don't mind killing them. You know, I say hey, self defense, okay. But termites does not hurt human being. They they they, they eat the wood of your house, so that's bad enough for some people because it's a you know for for most of people a house is the most expensive possession they have. Uh, I understand that, but look at them, right? They're, they're kind of round body, and their head is kind of round, and uh, the soft body, and they're clean insect. They, they're kind of cute when they're running around. Uh, I feel real bad killing them these days. I mean, when I'm observing them, I sometimes look at them, I put some kind of poison next to it. There. What the hell am I doing? You know? Oh. <laughs> 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 oh, that is the funniest, funniest thing yeah. to hear from a guy. Well, that means that you're uh, you're human. That's that confirms yeah. that you're you're human. So yeah, that, I'm not sure I'm going to extend the invention, shave my head, or go to Buddhist monk and just uh, try to cleanse my sin for for killing so many termites. I'm yeah. not sure I go that far, but eh, who knows? You have the consideration more so than most people, and I think that's really <sighs> what what matters. So. Have you have you traveled a lot with your research? And where are some of the most beautiful places that maybe you or on just vacation? Where are some of the most beautiful places that you've been that you enjoyed? You know, I was in Canary Island um, in November uh, last year. That is re that remind me of Hawaii a lot because the volcano island in the middle of the ocean uh, and Hawaii is probably one of the more most beautiful places I've ever been. I still, every now and then when I go back to Hawaii, I'm still kind of take my breath away. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And the Canaries, is that, where is that? That's the one off the coast of Europe or is in the middle of the uh, ocean? It's a little bit south of Spain and not in the east, uh, uh, west of uh, uh, North Africa. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 In, in Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. Just out there on your own, naked, just you in the ocean. <laughs> That's no, actually, actually, the reason why I was there because of termites again. <laughs> oh, cool. the tropical, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you and termites have that in common. You both like the tropical conditions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, you're just an absolute treasure and a, and a joy to talk to. Um, let's do it again sometime. Um, is there anything you want to add before we go? Uh, not really. Yeah. It was, it was fun to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, we I appreciate what you do. You're a wonderful human being. Dr. Nan Yao Su, uh, University of Florida, PhD entomology, all around good person, wonderful human being. Thanks. Nice, nice talk to you, Chris. We'll talk after this, but we'll say goodbye to everybody. Thanks for coming, everybody. Okay. See you. Bye. Bye.